Hey guys, Michael Corsentino with a companion video for this month's feature all about off-camera flash. So first of all, I want to thank the Shutter Mag uh, and Shutter Fest community for uh, letting me know loud and clear that there was a definite need for some basic off-camera flash instruction. It makes perfect sense uh, because there are so many new people coming in to the industry. Uh, on a yearly basis and that of course the need to understand light and understand off-camera flash would be there so thanks for the reminder it's kind of easy for me to take things for granted uh, you know given that I've been doing this stuff for so long so sometimes I miss the fact that there's a need for some basic instruction and understanding about flash so that's what this month is all about in both the article and the video. So let's take a look first of all at why bother. So why is off-camera off flash so important? Why do we want to go through the effort of learning about off-camera flash and investing in the gear and building that skill set? Well, here's why. First of all, with off-camera light, you're going to be able to create the light that you want rather than working with the light that you're given. So in this sh example shot here, this light was just simply not there. I mean, the light that's on that model and the light that's coming from behind her was a two-light setup uh, combined with the ambient light that's existing uh, was simply not available without using off-camera flash. So I'm able to introduce shadow and highlight and create volume a lot more freely uh, than I can uh, without off-camera light, it's just simply not possible without, uh, and you know, a lot more difficult if you can, uh, just, just definitely doesn't give you the freedom to kind of put light where you want it, um, or create a, a various qualities of light, which we'll talk about a little bit later in the video, and which I cover in the article. Uh, I also encourage you to uh, reach back into some of the past articles as I've covered a lot of what we're going to talk about here kind of in a broad overview of, I've really delved into a lot more deeply in some of the past articles so definitely have a look at some of that stuff because I think it'll it'll help uh, clarify some things if you have questions and of course you know questions on the Facebook page are also always welcome so the other thing that allow you to do is work with independent zones of light so in multiple speed light or multiple strobe scenarios you're able to really put light where you want it or even if you're using the sun as a backlight and an off-camera flash as a key light there are ways that you can work with multiple and um, independent zones of light that are really going to give you just so much more control I said my next bullet point is infinite control of photography's core components which are light and shadow if you think about it photography is all about light and shadow so absent the use and control of off-camera lighting I would say that you're really missing out on one of the huge aspects of photography uh, which is a light and shadow and being able to really control it and shape it and create exactly the kind of light that you want rather again than what you're given and that really increases your creativity exponentially it takes everything to a whole new level so that's my pitch for off-camera lighting I would say definitely it's worth the effort it's worth building that skill set and investing in the gear I think that the payoff is huge and you'll really see tremendous growth in your photography and the expression that you can bring to your photography all right so let's dig in here and take a look so the first thing that you're gonna need to do when it comes to off-camera flash is getting your flash off the camera and whether that's a speed light or a strobe it's the same thing the main thing is you want to be working with your lights off of your camera and you do that because you're able to introduce direction and shadow and um, you're able to control the quality of light a lot more um, with a lot more you know uh, for lack of a better word um, robustness or just you know a lot more uh, ability a lot more options I should say uh, than you have with your camera on on your uh, with than you have with your flash on your camera when it's on the camera you're locked into that one particular look um, and I would tell you that it's really not the best look even if with even with flat lighting you want to be off your camera because then you can introduce direction from above etc etc but I don't want to get ahead of myself so let's just cover the basics again getting your flash off of your camera that's step number one Okay, step number two is you're going to need a way to uh, communicate between the camera and your flash. So you have several different types of triggers which allow you to do this. There are optical triggers and there are radio triggers. Radio triggers are what I always recommend because with optical triggers you have the limitation of something called line of sight which means that the flash and the trigger or the camera need to see one another. Okay, they need to have direct communication through their line of sight. Absent that, if you take out that line of sight, the communication breaks down. 
All right, so why is that important? Well, let's say you wanted to put your flash behind a wall or behind a car or somewhere where there was not a direct line of sight between the trigger that you had on your camera and your flash. Right away, you know, your creative options are very limited. Um, also, sunlight can trip up uh, optical triggers, There's a whole, and they have very short range. So there's a whole slew of reasons why radio-based triggers are going to be, you know, you, the, what I recommend and what my preference definitely are. Okay, so you, you see here on the upper left corner, we've got two triggers. One is the Nikon and one is the Canon. Uh, the Nikon is optical. Uh, Nikon shooters can always use the Pocket Wizard Flex TT5, which you see up here on the right. Uh, that is going to give you both manual and TTL control. The Canon will give you manual and TTL control as well. So that's the second recommendation, is that if you are working with speed lights, I would recommend that you get a trigger that's going to give you both manual as well as TTL control. So that's the second, you know, triggers come in all sorts of stripes and sizes and flavors. The main thing is that they come in either optical or radio. We've covered that. They also come in something called uh, you know, a dumb trigger, which is just going to give on and off instructions. It's going to turn the light on or off. It simply does that. Or those that have TTL control as well, which is going to allow you to communicate metering information from your camera to your flash. And sometimes strobes as well now, like the Profoto B1 and some other entries into the marketplace, Fotix, etc., have strobes that will allow you have actual strobes, not speed lights, which give you a lot more power uh, over a speed light, but yet allow you to communicate metering information from the camera, TTL. They allow you to work in TTL mode. So again, oh, and there's also um, down here on the bottom, I've included a, um, a cable from OCF Gear, off-camera gear, off-camera flash gear. Uh, it's Silarina's company. Uh, and he's got this cable which allows you to work in manual or TTL. It's only going to give you one, one flash, one speed light uh, to work with at a time. However, if budget is a concern and you're just getting started, uh, you know, you, and you really want to, you know, you should start experimenting with off-camera flash. This is a really inexpensive way for you to do it. I want to say it's about $50. So it really removes any, any obstacles for you to get started. So I would say, you know, if that's been keeping you, it's been holding you back, you know, use the cable because that's going to get you started. Um, and it's a great start. It works perfectly. And so, uh, there's no excuse for not starting. So that's triggers. Uh, let's go. Sorry, we're going the wrong way. All right, so now once people get their, their flashes off of the camera, then it starts, the, the anxiety sets in. It's like, okay, well, why am I doing this and how do I do it and what do I do now that I've got my flash off the camera? So I want to remove some of that anxiety and really break it down into some of the key core components of off-camera flash. And just for you to don't overcomplicate things. I want you to bear in mind that things are lighting is really simple at its core. To get good at it takes time like anything, but the core principles are fairly simple. So let's take a look at them. So let's take a look at understanding light. So I've broken it down into four basic components here. I covered three in the article. I wanted to add an extra one in for this video. So that's going to be QQDD. So what exactly does QQDD mean? It's four key principles. Quantity of light, quality of light, direction of light, and distance and size of light. Okay, QQDD, quantity of light, quality of light, direction of light, distance and size of light. Very simple, very basic concept. Let's take a look at each one. All right, quantity of light. Quantity of light is simply the amount of light or luminosity contributed to an exposure, right? So it's just how much power, how much output, think of it like volume control on a stereo, how much you're getting from that source, how much power, how much light, how much luminosity you're getting. And speed lights and strobes are controlled a little bit differently in the way that they deal with their power in terms of the, the numbers that are used for their settings, but it's really the same thing. It's just how much light are you getting from that light source? And you just dial it up or down. Really simple. It's up to you to determine how much light you want. Quality of light. 
quality of light has to do with do you want soft light or do you want hard light? Soft light has gradual transitions from highlight to shadow, while hard light has rapid transitions with much crisper, harder definitions between shadow and highlights. I've covered this in recent articles. I encourage you to go check it out. I can't delve as deeply as I'd like to because of time limitations, but there's tons of information from past articles. Here you see a really great example of soft light. You can see that the shadows, the transition from shadow to highlight is very soft. And with hard light, it's the opposite. This is a perfect example of a harder light source. So here we're talking about direction of light. Okay, direction of light. The position of the lights relative to the subject governs the amount of shadows introduced. So what exactly does that mean? I've got a little diagram here to spell it out. Okay, again, this was also covered in a previous article, so refer to that for more, but basically it's really simple. It just means that the position of your light in relationship to the model is going to introduce more shadow. So you can see here, I've got this circle around our subject. This is an overhead view. And you can see here that from the 12 o'clock position in the front, we've got something called paramount lighting, which is a very flat style of lighting. And, you, and that's because we don't have any direction to our light. Our light is right in front of our model. We have not moved it side to side yet. So we have a very flat quality of light. And that is what we're looking at here in the upper left hand corner. And as we move either left or right to, from, to the side, we start with, we en enter into loop lighting and then next up is gonna be Rembrandt lighting and then split lighting and then all the way over to rim and accent lighting. So it's a really simple, so this is direction of light. Very important, but very simple concept. But you can see the dramatic difference in the quality of light that it, uh, that it contributes. All right, distance and size of light. This is the thing, that, this is the one component that I added in that was not covered in the article. Uh, distance and size of light. So the distance from the light source to the subject and its size impacts light hardness and softness. Okay, so the closer and larger the source, the softer the light and the larger its perceived size. In other words, if I take a, a moderately sized softbox, let's say it's two by three, and I place it eight feet away, in relationship to the subject, it's really pretty small. But if I take that same two by three softbox and I move it right up against my subject, just out of the camera frame, its perceived size is much larger. Consequently, the quality of light that it's going to deliver is much softer, okay? So really simple. You want really soft light, bring your source really close. If you want really hard light, move your source back. And I would say remove your softbox because then it's gonna become a point light source, it's gonna become a much harder light source. All right, again, these concepts are really pretty straightforward and simple. All right, manual flash exposure. Manual flash exposure is best used in situations where distances between your lights and subject are not changing. So a, subject, a, a shot like this, for example, where I'm not having my subjects moving around a lot, where the, where the background is static. Um, if you're working in a studio, let's say, um, where you're just lighting up the background and you're lighting up the subject and you know, there's not a whole lot of movement. Again, manual flash. People get really freaked out by manual flash, but it is one of the most simple ways to work. TTL is more complicated, but people are more comfortable with it because the camera get, kind of gets you into the ballpark, all right? But manual flash is dead simple. It's just how much power uh, you're just setting the power and you just have to figure out where you want that power to be. You can start somewhere, start at half power, start at you know, quarter power, uh, and then work back from there and you know, get yourself dialed into exactly where you want to be in terms of your uh, aperture and your shutter speed. It's really very simple. Um, next up, it, and you, you can combine these two uh, exposure modes also. Refer to the article for a little bit more on that. Okay, TTL flash exposure. TTL flash is great when, if, when you are in fast moving situations where the subject and light source distances are changing on the fly, okay? So if you, be, and the reason for that is because the camera is communicating exposure data and distance data to the, to the flash, to the strobe or to the speed light, and it's allowing you, it, it's doing all that heavy lifting for you, getting you into the ballpark for your exposure on the fly, okay, which is great. However, it's gonna give you a very average exposure. So it, then it's up to you using shutter speed and flash exposure compensation to control the exposure overall and dial it up or down and kind of really fine tune the light and get just the look that you want. And again, I would say refer back to the article for more on that. 
All right, lastly, modifiers matter. Sometimes I get the question, what's the perfect modifier to use outside? And I, I have to just always put that back on the person asking the question and say, well, what kind of light are you looking for? What quality of light are you looking for? Do you want a very soft light? Do you want a very hard light? Do you want a contrasty light? Uh, you know, what quality of light do you want? So experiment with modifiers. Uh, soft boxes have an edge. Umbrellas are very broad and soft. There are all sorts, you know, grids are very tight and constrained and will give you a much more crisp quality of light. So each one of these tools has a different um, a different purpose and a different use. There's no one size fits all light modifier that's going to work all the time. There are some that have, have multiple uses and that are good in you know multiple situations. But I always say, you know, build your vocabulary. Experiment with as many light modifiers as you can. Borrow them from friends. Rent them. You know, invest in them if if you feel they're a good fit. Um, but they're definitely going to give you a different quality of light. All right, so I hope that this video in conjunction with the article has helped shed some light, no pun intended, on off-camera flash. Uh, I look forward to seeing all you guys at Shutterfest and in uh, future articles. So get out there, experiment, have fun, and we'll see you next time.